Lucy Letby. Serial killer. Why did she kill? Part 11. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. We continue our careful examination of the information and evidence to make a determination as to what Lucy Letby is. It's evident that some people haven't grasped the fact that it is most important to evaluate a lot of the evidence to make a determination as to what she is. And the purpose of each of these parts is to take sections of different aspects of her life, her childhood, her involvement with her parents, how she appeared in court, what she did in relation to the grievance, and so on and so forth, and demonstrate to you how it could mean one thing, it might be interpreted in another way, and so forth, to encourage you to apply your mind as to what it might mean. I will then gather together everything that we have considered and explain to you what it actually does mean, how when we look at it in aggregate, we're able then to make a determination as to what she is. But in these interim stages, I am presenting the evidence and information to you and offering to you possible interpretations to encourage you to consider it before providing you with a conclusion in due course. I thought it was worthwhile to emphasise that for anybody who might happen to be hard of understanding. We're now going to turn to the handwritten notes that Lucy Letby generated, which for some was seen as the particularly damning evidence on which she ought to have been convicted and indeed was. For some people, the fact of these notes, which appeared to include confessions, was powerful evidence to support the fact that she's guilty. Last autumn, the case against her had opened with a flourish when the prosecution produced a green post-it note discovered by police after Lucy Letby's arrest. Covered in a desperate scrawl, it included phrases like I am evil. I did this. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to live. I am an awful person. The prosecution, understandably, held this up as a confession. The defence argued it was an anguished creed de coeur written by the wrongly accused. It's fair to say that it's probably the most significant insight that we have into Letby's state of mind. Let's analyse those phrases. They were written by her. There was no suggestion that she was forced to write them, that it was a consequence of someone compelling her to do so, that she wrote them of her own volition. There are those that would think such an admission of being evil not only shows an awareness, but also that one is reveling in it. However, such an admission that has been demonstrated in these words is not ordinarily something that one would find with a psychopath. The psychopath wouldn't describe themselves as not good enough. A psychopath wouldn't describe themselves as an awful person. A psychopath wouldn't say, I don't deserve to live. A high-functioning psychopath may well understand that other people could regard their actions as awful. They could also recognise that other people would regard their actions as evil. But they wouldn't say to themselves, I am an awful person, 
because the psychopath is entirely satisfied with what they are. Indeed, the psychopath effectively takes pride in what they are. Such comments that were made by Letby were underpinning, again, the victim mentality. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to live. I am an awful person. In the moment of writing those, that isn't an actual admission, a genuine admission of recognising she's not good enough, nor is it a genuine admission that she doesn't deserve to live, nor is it a genuine admission that she sees herself as an awful person. But rather, her writing those things down was done in order to create material for the purposes of a pity play in that moment with the anticipation that it might be read. It may well be the case that at the time that she wrote them, she was facing some threat to her control. It's unlikely that she saw it as such. But the manner in which she had compiled these notes, scrawled across the post-it notes, scrawled across the paper, things crossed out, the handwriting all over the place it wasn't neat lines. It was almost like a vomit draft of thoughts, observations. And it seems to me that this was a reaction, significant hurricane. And in the circumstances, she wasn't able to deal with the control directly. She wasn't able to assert control over it head on but rather took to the creation of these documents that seemed to be confessions, but it were in actual fact were being created in order to create a sense of control by anticipating that they would be read and that people would feel sorry for her. The countenance of Lucy Letby was very much, as you saw from the information about her appearance at trial, was one of a victim, crying for herself, not for the children that she murdered, sitting with a comforter as if she was five years old. Similarly, this was an instance of behaviour where she responded to what was clearly a substantial threat to control. Maybe something had happened at work, Maybe it was following the fact that she had killed the children that day. And it's not remorse, it's not a sudden burst of conscience, but rather a response to try and address a threat to her need for control. This wasn't the only scribbled memo police found. Letby had covered all sorts of pieces of paper with her ramblings. Tightly packed lines of handwriting laid bare her mindset as she was taken off duty as a nurse. Nursing was her life. It provided with a raison d'etre. Taking her off duty as a nurse would amount to a massive threat to control with regard to what she believed she was there to do. Remember, she's always said she'd wanted to be a nurse. She explained as a child she always wanted to be a nurse. She wanted to be a nurse because of what happened to her when she was born. More about that on another occasion. And therefore, removing her from the very thing that she believed that she was put on this planet to do would amount to a significant and substantial threat to control, but also the fact that so many people would know about it. Her mother and father the ever-doting and praising and proud parents would realise that their little angel had done something wrong and therefore there would be exposure. Colleagues would know that she was suspected or that something had gone wrong. And therefore, not only was the central existence of her life, but other people were going to know about it. And therefore, that would amount to a massive threat to control. And results in this scrambled, almost word salad-like ramblings that have been created. 
please help me. I can't do this anymore. Hate my life. I want someone to help me, but they can't. Again, all seem like the victim mentality and pity play. These phrases were all scrawled alongside the names of friends, colleagues, and the married doctor, whose name was embellished with love heart doodles, which again provides us with insight as to how she saw that individual. One of the notes was found inside Letby's 2016 diary, a journal with a cartoon bear on its cover and the tagline, Have a lovely year. Lucy Letby said writing her thoughts down was something she had done all her life and they were private notes she never thought anyone would read. She said she had difficulty throwing things away. Those comments, of course, come after the event, when she's being cross-examined. And it's my view that when she wrote these, she very much intended that someone read, would read them and that they would feel sorry for her. She was asked to explain why she had written not good enough at the top of one note. She explained, that's the overwhelming feeling I had about myself at that point because of the way people had made me feel. I thought I had been incompetent or done something wrong. It's just me processing thoughts. I very much doubt that she ever did think that she'd done anything wrong, not genuinely, but rather... This wasn't a moment of shame that she was experiencing, but it seems to me more likely that she was being guided to feel sorry for herself and issue these repeated pity plays as a means of nullifying a substantial threat to control that had arisen. Another part where she had written provides us with some very meaningful information. She wrote, I will never have children or marry. I will never know what it's like to have a family. If she has strong narcissistic traits, if she is a narcissist, she would have envy with regard to the contentment of others with regard to the fact that they were married, that they had a family unit, that they now had children. Non-narcissists, of course, can lament the fact that they don't have a relationship, that they are not with somebody, that they don't have a family, and feel sad about it. And that's entirely understandable. But what about an individual who might be a narcissist expressing such concerns? It would be deemed to be failure, and failure is a threat to control. And it may well be that this is at the crux of what has driven Lucy Letby's behaviour with regard to the fear of failure, the fear of of not being successful in the realm of children and marriage, and that therefore something drove her to respond to that ever-present threat in a way which compelled her to commit the crimes that she did. We will be returning to that mindset in due course. When she was asked about the issue of what she had written, she explained, I felt an immense responsibility. I thought I had been incompetent, incompetent or done something wrong that had harmed children. She knew that she had. And it seems to me that the questions that she's asked about why did you write these things, she's unlikely to know the genuine reason that it appears that it was done to try and nullify a threat to control. And instead, when asked about it, 
She then has to dismiss it by explaining that she was in a state, that she was worried that she'd done something wrong to perhaps maintain that facade of being a caring individual. It's certainly the case that such concerns as to, oh, I've done something wrong, I'm not good enough, those are not comments that you would find in relation to the way that a psychopath would behave. The skittishness that's associated with them, the self-reflection that it appears to include. More likely, a psychopath, if they were compelled to write anything, would describe what had been done and they would describe the feeling of satisfaction and power associated with what they have done, if they were moved to write about it. With reference to the phrase, I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them and I'm a horrible evil person, let be insisted she wasn't referring to murdering the children, but that she had somehow failed in my duties, in my competencies. She added, I had been taken away from the job I loved and accused of things I just hadn't done. Again, we see how important that is to her. But perhaps it is far more important than she actually realises and is central to her existence and her need for control. Let be explained that after gaining a QIS qualification in 2014, it enabled her to work with babies in intensive care, and that was predominantly what she did. She explained, I was very flexible to changing shifts and doing overtime. I didn't have a family, she said. I did enjoy intensive care work. I think all nurses on the unit had an area they preferred. No aspect of my work was ever boring. She explained that she'd cared for hundreds of babies during the period she is said to have attacked and found to have attacked the 17 infants. Those are the key aspects from the notes that have been written, and it provides us with more meaningful insight as to what Lucy Letby is. We're now, in part 12, going to turn to the defence that she gave in relation to each and all of the allegations that she faced. Join me there. <laughs>